Hello everybody, welcome to my DIY lathe carriage stop video. I made this specifically for the Grizzly G0602, but for any other machine, you can use this design for inspiration by changing the dimensions to your specific machine. Please click like or subscribe if you enjoy this kind of content and welcome to the video. We need to measure our way here and it's kind of difficult because it's, it's hard to measure something that isn't a uh, perpendicular lines. So you might have to get a little creative. Uh, what I did is I measured this way. I got 47 millimeters. And then this was approximately 15 from here to here. The backside is 18. And then for this height here, you have to get a little creative. Got a couple one, two, three blocks. So that's 50.8 for the two millimeters tall. And then you go down, it's approximately 40.6. 50.8 minus 40.6 is gonna be the height here. These are the approximate dimensions of my lathe. It's not 100% perfect. I will warn you of that because measuring this is not very easy. I don't have the schematics for this. So I had to use some intuition. I used that design as the inspiration for this part, the main body. It's a little bit chaotic, but you can hit pause and look at the dimensions in more detail. I'm going to start with the main body and I'm choosing to make this out of aluminum. One, because it's easier to cut and two, because I don't really want to scratch up my ways with a piece of steel. And all it really needs to do is hold a stop and a dial indicator. So I'm going to square off this, this end and then I'm going to work on making this piece the right dimensions for a starting block. I usually start by cutting this face that I cut with the saw. The mill can do a lot better job than the saw can. And this method is just really quick. It doesn't need to be absolutely perfect for this application. So what I do is I just face one of the sides, flip it over, and now I'm gonna face it for the thickness, the right dimension. And eventually I'll turn it over 90 degrees. In between, I usually file off the little burrs. And now that the top and bottom are a little more parallel, I set it in the vise and do the other sides, same process, check for thickness afterwards. And because this piece is fairly thick and rigid, I can do the send down end without having to worry about too much chatter and vibration. I have my starting block dimensions. This is 3.875 long, approximately. There we go, 3.875 and a half. There we go, by 1.25. This side here, 0.875, 874 and a half. I'm gonna approach this main body in three setups. Uh, this is probably going to be the most difficult one, and I'm going to start with that one first because if I mess it up, it's all on this side of the block. If I mess it up, you know, I still have a good piece of metal left over to use for something else. Hopefully I don't do that, but I'm going to go in rough in. I'm going to go 388 thousandths deep by 1216 here, and we'll start with that. I use the fine adjustment knob on the quill. Just slowly bring it down until I see chips flying or feel the vibrations. I usually have my headphones on listening to music. And what I'll do is I'll lock that quill in place, adjust my height of my head to zero, and then I'll bring it down partially, maybe 0.1 of the dimension that I'm going to be going because this is going to be 388. Bring it over, slightly touch. I'm going to assume that it might be about a half thousandth in already after I start feeling that cutting. And then you'll see me adjust this knob to zero right now. I just adjusted my Z height all the way down to 388 and then just changed my dimension, my X dimension, until I got to that 1216 like I talked about before. All right, I got my 1216 deep by 388 down. This side of the V-notch is gonna be a V in here. 
This side's a little bit taller than this side. This side's 103 thousandths deeper. So I need to cut out a little bit more. I've locked my X travel so that I can't go this way or that way. And I'm just going to go down 103 thousandths from this point. All right, I need to create that little flat spot that's going to be at the bottom of our V-notch, which is the top of my, my way. I have a little 5 30 seconds bit in here. I need to go down 0.9 inches from this surface and 754 thousandths over from this surface. I was at 1216 with a half inch bit, so that put that center line at 966. So minus 754, that gives us 12 or 212 thousandths I had to move left to get to that center point of the V. And I will do that last little bit now. Okay. And I need to go to 0 0.9. I'm going to touch the surface. I'm going to go 0 0.9 minus 388 down. It's quite a lot of stick out for this fairly thin end mill, but I'm taking it up fairly slow. Um, I had to worry about hitting that shoulder up above with my with the head of my mill. So that's why it's like that. Here's the tricky part. I know that this V is going to start 191 thousandths from this edge, but there's really no way, there's no reference point that I can use easily anyways. So I'm just going to eyeball it. I got my line drawn at 191 thousandths. I'm going to drag it down until it starts cutting and then move it back until it touches that line. And then I'm going to use the quill to go this direction. It's the only part on this mill right now that's going to actually go at the direction that I want to cut is the quill because the head is turned 45 degrees. So I'm going to start it up. All right, I had a little bit of a boo-boo there. I didn't quite have it in the chuck 100% tight because I'm filming and I forget things when I'm filming. This is why I don't like filming things. So I have this, I scootered it up so that it barely nicked the wall and then I backed it off a little bit so it's not. Now I'm gonna go straight down with the head rather than going this way. All right, I had the basic shape cut out. I knew this was not ever going to be perfect, but it's, it's close enough to hold. I'm making a lot of assumptions. I don't know that this is 90 degrees. It could be 89.3 for all I know. Uh, I just assume that people like to pick normal numbers. And then also cutting this out is not the most extremely easy thing. You have really no frame of reference for any sort of accuracy. So, it turned out well enough for it to work, and that's good enough. I have my second setup now. I need to drill a couple holes through this. The first one's going to be in the center of the stock, 1,689 thousandths in from this edge. I got my edge finder here. It's got a little bit of run out, so I just wait for the light to turn on. And stay on. Here we go. Squeak. So I'm a zero mark. I gotta move it 0.1 more because the tip of that edge finder is 0.2. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 
13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 89. There we go. Gonna raise this sucker up because it's too low. This edge. Okay. So that's this is seven eighths thick, so half of that would be seven sixteenths. Yay fractions. All right, so 7 sixteenths is 0 0.4375 plus 0 0.15375. One, two, three, four, five, and 37 and a half. And I'm gonna lock down my X and Y travel so it can't go anywhere. Start drilling. I almost always start with the center drill for accuracy reasons because drill bits can kind of wander at the beginning. This is just a six millimeter hole for an M6 bolt. I have it set up for the next little bit. What I'm going to do is just bring this down and just scratch it just to mark this spot and I'll return to it later. So The next hole will be a 10 millimeter hole. It's 543 thousandths and then 64 thousandths off center towards this side. I'm just gonna drill and then use a 10 millimeter ream at the end. Now time for the 10 millimeter ream. Still sitting above that hole, I gotta move it back 64 thousandths to get to the center. All right, now I gotta mill a slot. This is a half inch end mill. I'm gonna make it two, 0.2 inches deep. I'm gonna go to that little circle that I marked out before. I need to create a little step down because the distance from this little black ring to the end of this is less than the thickness of this. So when I put this in, it has this full length sticking out. I'm gonna go down about 80 thousandths and then uh, an inch deep that way. I went down 99% of my Z height and then for a finishing pass, just that last 1% for a nice finish. Let's check the effectiveness of our edge finder here. I ran a half inch end mill directly through the center. This is seven eighths wide. What's left should be three eighths. And that divided by two is one eight seven five. And I got that on that side and a half thousand underneath on that side. So it works pretty well. All right, I need to tap a M8 by 0.75 hole. I've done the drill size and I chose M8 by 0.75 because it's the finest pitch that I have in something mildly big in diameter. So when I turn it, it advances forwards or backwards, the least amount that I currently have as far as taps go. This is just a cheap junk tap that I have floating around. It's got quite a bit of run out on it. It's uh, or bent because I bent it, which I dealt with this fine thread, but it is what it is. All right, I don't have any three eighths reams. 
I only have metric ones, and this shaft is 3 8 If I use a drill bit, I know it's going to be oversized, and it's going to be sloppy in that hole. So I'm going to use the boring head, which is great for regular size holes that uh, you're never going to find a drill bit for. Or in this case, I can make a more precise 3 8 hole because I can adjust the size to basically whatever I want, except for way too big. And right now it's at 358 thousandths. And I'm gonna move it five. And that should bring it to 368 thousandths. And as I get closer, I'll make finer and finer adjustments until the dial indicator fits really well. And also it intersects a hole going through. So it has an interrupted cut. And if I use a drill bit, I know that once it gets to that point, it's going to deflect and make an even bigger hole on the backside. Take a measurement. All right. I have the hole drilled now. And this was a little undersized. It wasn't exactly 375 thousandths, so I'm glad I used the boring bar. I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly perfect. You can go in and be all sloppy, but as a machinist, and I'm going to be using this a lot, I don't want to feel that. It's every, every day is just going to remind me of some kind of failure, so I don't want that. And it goes in well enough to stay in place on its own. I already had the boring head in there from my previous operation. And I want to just put a nice finish over all of it. Because now that I'm done with the external features, I don't really need them as a reference point. And the end product doesn't need to be any particular size, really. So I just stuck a, an extra boring bar on the opposite side of this boring head for balance. It's, it's a quite high RPM. Now it's time to make all the little parts you need to complete the rest of this. This is the indicator locker. I chose this design because I didn't really want to have a pinch bolt system because a pinch bolt system would have added extra length to the main body, maybe like 15 millimeters or so, enough for a bolt to go through, plus that little cut, that little slit. And then I would probably would have had to use a wrench to tighten it because I can't do that with my fingers. I just don't have that strength. I don't think anybody does. I have pretty strong hands. And then on, this is just a 10 millimeter shaft with a M6 by one thread on the end. I left a little shoulder on the end so that it captures this piece inside the main body. This die that I had was really junk. It left kind of a crap thread, but it's going to be good enough. All right, I have my shaft made that's going to hold the dial indicator in place. I have it set up so it's in the exact right position. And I gotta go in 80 thousandths to create a 3 eighths by 80 thousandths deep little notch in this thing. And we'll get started on that. I'm gonna go plunge, advance, plunge. This is obviously very unrigid, as untechnically as I can put it. Let's test out the fit on this. It's basically just a wedge nut that picks up and grabs onto this caliper. There we go. I went a little deeper than 80 thousandths and that's because I wanted to be able to get this in there without getting, you know, having the suns aligned. If this isn't the nut that I will be using, 
I'll be using something else later that I'm going to be making, but seems to work. Stepping back to the mill for this next part, I made this part out of steel because I didn't really want it to be very flexy. And also it's just going to be grabbing onto the underside of the way where stuff grabs onto it currently. So it didn't matter if it scratched it. I had this piece of metal that I got from something. I always save my scraps in case, you know, I need something that's basically that shape. And this is what I'm going to be turning into the clamp that gets picked up and then squeezes the, the main plate to the bottom, which is this, on the way. I just used a six millimeter end mill to knock this out really quickly. And I'm going to be using this for a six millimeter slot on the backside once I flip it over for an M6 bolt to go through it. This carbide end mill was is pretty old and it's been pretty durable and I don't care about what happens to it anymore. I've been using it for a long time. I didn't really know what material this piece of scrap that I had was made out of. So it worked pretty well. I just used all the exterior features to knock this part out uh, really quickly. It didn't need to be dimensionally very perfect. It was just a clamp. I usually start by making a slot by creating two holes of the right diameter, in this case six millimeter, on the beginning and end in the precise locations. And then I switch back to the six millimeter end mill to clear out the center section. This allows me to change my Z height in the middle of cutting without it chattering too much. And then I went two millimeters either direction for a 10 millimeter slot for the head of the bolt to help hold it captive so that when I turn the bolt on the top, it doesn't spin. And now onto the last four pieces of this. This is just some steel for the carriage stop bolt. I threaded the end for my fingers for a nice grip. And this is just going to be eight millimeter shaft with an M8 by 0.75 on there, like I use for the main body. And I create a little step down. So for the end of the thread, it's about 20,000 steep. And I couldn't actually get the cutter all the way to the right, so I had to leave a little bit of extra stock on the end. And that's why you see that little, that little beginning part with no threads on it. The threading went pretty well. It was only about a, I don't know, 20,000 steep thread. And I have my rigid uh, tool post on there, so I use that for cutting threads so that it doesn't uh, chatter and uh, give me a, a terrible finish on the threads. I start out with a cutting cutoff tool, switch over to that for a nice little chamfer on the end. I don't really care what the angle is. I don't want to cut my fingers on the ed end of this thing. And for the knobs, I just used uh, some brass that I had laying around. The, d the external diameter was whatever the brass was. I it didn't really matter. Put some knurling on this for a nice grip. And I'm gonna make be making three knobs out of this. So this first part, this is going to be my M8 knob, and I make the other two knobs after this. It's the exact same process. I didn't feel like filming it. And then I wanted to create a nice little surface finish on the top, plus I had to cut off that little excess of the threaded M6 threaded portion of the, the indicator lock bolt. So it performed two functions by doing this. I didn't have any way of holding this, and that's why I you see it being held with the indicator in there. I had a little bit of oil on the lens, sorry about that. And now I'm just gonna harden this and create a black finish on these parts. It's not gonna be super hard because this torch doesn't get hot enough to make these glowing red hot, but it's gonna be better than nothing. Doing this outside because it gets pretty stinky. This too gets very stinky. I believe it forms hydrogen sulfide when you anise parts in the sulfuric acid. So what I do is I just leave the vicinity while it's going on. It takes about two hours. I keep a lid on it to keep the spiders and, and bugs and the grinding dust from falling in. Strangely enough, the spiders do not dissolve. Just in case you wanted to know that. I also keep my anode out of the solution when, it, when not in use to keep uh, aluminum sulfide from forming and uh, degrading my acid solution. You choose the amperage based upon the surface area of your part and I 
did this is kind of a complicated part so i just did it in cad clicked on the properties of this item and based upon that about 1.05 amps for these two parts i found that once all the toxic stuff is done i just bring this into the house it's so much easier we got pans multiple cooking surfaces running water whatever to do this Five minutes was the approximate amount of time for the blueness to be the right blueness for me. I have the black on the left and I just leave that in for a long time because black is black no matter what. <laughs> That's staying in the video. I just wanted to make fun of my wife. She was being really obnoxious, so I left that part in. She just went down and just set stuff on the table and was uh, shook the camera, everything. So I had to refilm this all over again. I said, it's fine if you make noise, just don't shake the table. And I just wanted to show this process of how it's assembled for you folks watching this. It's not too terribly exciting, but we're here. You're watching it. You know you are. I just used uh, a long enough M6 bolt. I didn't feel like making a bolt. I just, if I have it, don't want to thread things unnecessarily. And it worked. As you can see, that slides back and forth. And use some washers to keep the knobs from uh, chafing up the surface of the blue. For those wondering what does this thing actually do and why would I want one or make one? So you got your lathe and you got your half nut lever that when you engage it, it cuts, it feeds at a cost, at a constant rate and cuts material. But the problem is what if I want exactly, you know, one inch when I, when I shut off the, the half nut, it stops at a point And I mean, you can draw a line on here and, and be like, okay, I guess that's good enough. Um, but what if it's really important? What if it needs to be exactly an inch or something like that? Or maybe it's something that's internal and you can't actually see, you can't draw a line because it's on the inside. And even if there was a line, you'd be cutting it away immediately anyways, probably. So you could also use this, which comes on the lathe. I, I obviously have something else. It's, it's a lot more rigid. This doesn't move, whereas this does. You can obviously use this and then turn your dial, you know, the right amount. But the problem is that unless it's exactly zero degrees, it's going to be cutting a taper to your piece. Unless you put it on there, put a dial indicator on and watch as it goes this way and make sure there's no change in, uh, in that dimension. But let's say you just cut a 45 degree angle using that thing and now it's back to zero. You don't want to do that every single time. So a lot of people, what I usually do when I use that, I would go in, get most of my cut done down to the right depth. And then I would bring this in, hit the half nut, let it follow the nice parallel path of the ways and then finish cranking it down to that last little bit at the end using this this wheel but what if I didn't have to use that what if I wanted to use this rigid thing or you could use the the other part as well and just not cut a taper and just use and use the nice parallel ways to cut your your cylinder here so on the left you can see I got a dial I, I have this set up just for 0.8 of an inch all right Let's just pretend I'm going to cut an internal whatever diameter on the inside to 0.88 of an inch long. All right. So what I can do is I can turn on my half nut, let it go until it gets close to the stop down here, disengage. You know, it would be feeding in like so. I would shut off my lever and it's really close. And then I could just go boop and you can see right at the zero okay and then i would back it off hit it again for my next pass let it keep going 
and disconnect and then bring my wheel over. That way, every single time, it would be pretty close to 0.8 inches. But you could also use it in, in other ways. Let's say you had, you know, you cut this on the outside and there was a shoulder here 0.8 inches away. I could also just be real lazy and just cut more than I want. And then I can get out my caliper and measure how long that is. If it's 0.832, I would set this at, at the edge of your stock here and then just go in 32 follow 32 it's at 2 right now so I'm just going to 34 there we go face it now it's at 0.8 inches you also do it if it was too short you know it works the same way as if it was too long it's just the opposite direction and that's what it's really nice for, for creating easier, faster uh, lengths at a certain more, more accurate dimension, plus um, having it be a non-taper using the nice parallel direction of the ways. Let's just do a sample. I had it at 0.8 before. Let's say I want to do uh, 375 thousandths or 3 eighths of an inch. Let's set that up. Okay, what I'm going to do probably is just uh, get this thing up and get it to zero. All right. And then I'm going to bring my tool up to the face of it, like so. I'll move my camera. Hopefully it stays there. And what I'm going to do is just, I already had the setup for that other demonstration. I'm just going to bring it up and tighten it in the jaws at that point. All right. That way I'm pretty close over here at zero. All right. So we're doing 0.375. So right now I'm at the face. Um, what I'm going to do is just see if I can loosen this a little bit and get it. So this is harder to do than just moving your stock because it's kind of fiddly. Well, it's closer than it was. All right. So what I'm going to do is move in to 0.375. There's one, two, three, and then 75. I'm going to move my camera and zoom in a little bit. All right. I'm going to change the angle. Come on, go down. There we go. All right, so now what I'm going to do is at 375, I'm going to move my stop to that point. until it starts hitting my carriage. Probably easier for these two hands. All right, tighten this down and I'm just gonna test it. See where it goes when it finally hits a stop. It's at 374, so I'm just gonna back it up just a little bit. And this is why I use really fine thread on the stop so that I can just make a little turn and it's not that much. And just that little bit, changed it a half a thousandth. If I want to be real anal about this. Let's see if that did it. Not quite. And just like so. So now it's at 375. And you can notice that you're kind of limited in this fashion to whatever length this is. And also, if you're real close up to the, the, the chuck or the jaws of the chuck, um, you might run out of room in this space. So that's one downside of this. But you could also, you know, move it out, move your stock out if it's big enough or use the, uh, the uh, a center on the end. And that's what this thing does. And uh, I'll show you. Take it off now, I'll show you kind of what it does. 
So I made it so that I didn't have to unscrew this a lot. All I had to do is basically just get it to loosen off of it and then it slides back and escapes this edge. So that way I could just slide it and then pop it off just like so. I didn't want to have a giant, have to loosen it, loosen it until it was open enough that I could actually pry this off. One thing I might change to this that I haven't done yet and I don't want to film it um, is put a couple little sticky up e knobs that I might thread in. So you got your kinetic coefficient of friction and then your static coefficient of friction. And basically what that means, let's say you're trying to push a box and it's not moving. It's currently stationary. It takes more force to get that to move than if it's already moving. So when I tighten this, it's already moving. I got my kinetic coefficient of friction going and it's stuck. Okay, now I got to get it off. Now it takes more force to remove it than it was to tighten it. So I might just put two knobs on, or two little sticky uppies. I always have something shaped like that. You know, I could put a, a nut on here and get a wrench out, but then I got to find that wrench. Um, and it gets really messy. As you can see in the video, it gets really messy. So it's a lot easier just to find something, you know, and stick it in here and just give it a little crank and have it come off. 